and original. From Story Studio Network. Once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. Okay, I gotta say, go Leafs go. We're gonna win the Stanley Cup this year. I love them. Go get them, guys. Thank you. Well, here we are. Look at that. April the 21st. It's a Friday morning here in this part of the world. Welcome in to the Your Ontario Politics Podcast. It's on the ledge, and we've got the usual suspects around the table. Sabrina Nanji joining us from Queen's Park Observer. John Wright is here from Maru Public Opinion. And Keith Leslie, you hear and see him on CH Television out of Hamilton. And i got to tell you... Um, this would have been a very different world if uh, things hadn't gone the way they went last night at the Scotiabank Arena here in Toronto. I think there would have been a general strike, just generally speaking. But you got to think, you know, it's all good. We've got, if it were the way it was when I was a kid in some of the playoffs, there used to be two games total goals. The Leafs would have won the two games by one goal, <laughs> right? <laughs> Getting blown out, blown out in the first game, 7-3. They won 7-2 last night, so... It's a little hard to take, but that, of course, was everyone, all of Ontario's premier, Doug Ford, cheering on the Leafs. I just wonder how much grief he was getting for, you know, doing that as all the Ottawa fans who, uh, I know they're not in the playoffs, but it doesn't really matter. I thought um, he said the sign doesn't say T.O. Toronto Place. It says Ontario Place. It says Ontario Sorry. Place. That's right. That's right. But that announcement, his, his cheering on the Leafs was actually made at the news conference that they held at the Ontario Place site. Lots to get into on that. Just, in, I mean, I, I know people are saying, oh, seriously, this is going to be the election issue for, you know, for the mayor of the city of Toronto. Um, this might Maybe. be one of the largest infrastructure <laughs> um, projects that uh, most people are going to pay attention to first. Second, it's the waterfront. I mean, we're not going to get this back. But explain to me, if you can, Sabrina, and, and I, I think some people are really scratching their heads, the degree to which we understand what's in the agreement with Thermospa in as much as what's, what are we actually signing on for here? And I don't want to necessarily get into whether it's good or it's bad. They've signed on. There was apparently some kind of bidding process. Then it gets murky after that. What do we know? Yeah, I would say probably, you know, where the Ford government could do better on this from all perspectives is transparency, um, which we don't have a lot of, especially with this science center move that I know we're going to dig into. Um, but with, with Therma, the spa company now, um, I think the thing that stood out to me the most about this deal is that the private, you know, Austrian based uh, uh, wellness company, as, as they like to call themselves, will be the ones in charge of like maintaining um the lands and so that's kind of a significant change from what we're seeing now and obviously you know what part is going to be private and what part is going to be public um you know we have seen the company change their proposal after this public backlash and so you know i i think that there's probably still room for some changes but what what the proposal is on the table now i think it is what we're we're going to get um there's a lot of questions about you know how accountable this company will be um you know public reporting and, and that sort of thing uh but i think what we know now is that they will be maintaining a, a big huge significant chunk uh, of, of the west part of, of Ontario place and uh, you know I guess some of the criticism now is because it's been so controversial that this science center move which is happening just so fast with very little information um, you know coming through it, it is, is this is going to be a, a cover kind of a way to distract and maybe change the channel for some of this controversy that's happening here. Now, just to go back to the, the, the maintenance issue, under the, and no one has said this is the case, and I think this is the problem that you point out, under the procurement, a public-private partnership could have design, build, finance, maintain, operate. It sounds like that's where they're going here, except they're not calling it a P3, but is Infrastructure Ontario involved in any of this discussion? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's why we saw infra Infrastructure Minister Kinga Surma up there. She's been the lead on this file. Um, you know, to hear 
the government talk about it. They've been working on this proposal to move the science center for years. And so obviously, you know, I mean, at the risk of scooping myself, I'm sure I'm not the only reporter that's filing these FOIs to get to get some information. But Infrastructure Ontario and the Infrastructure Ministry is one of those places that we're looking for this information. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really holding my breath because a lot of it is also going through cabinet. And we know that cabinet uh, decision making and what happens over there is kind of shielded from the public uh, when it comes to, you know, what, what, at least when we're filing freedom of information requests. And mm-hmm. so I guess I don't really have a very good, robust answer for you because we there's just so much that we don't know. We do yeah. know that they're going to spend a fortune for the parking garage. Uh, oh, and it's going to turn a profit. They didn't say who that profit's going to, presumably to the public, but a five-level parking garage on the waterfront as well to go with the thermos. Thermos? Is that what they're Therma. called? Thermae, thermos, thermos, Therma. whatever the heck they are. These Austrian guys coming in. Uh, come on. What are, what are we doing? They have no other spas, wellness spas, whatever the hell they're calling them, on waterfronts. They're given the edge of town, the edge of a city, like uh, uh, Canada's Wonderland was when they. And I know they're no longer the edge of the city, but when they started out, that was what. That's the type of properties these thermos guys have been getting elsewhere. Why are they getting waterfront in downtown Toronto? Some prime land. Okay, put a Canada's Wonderland. At least it's more of an attraction to the entire family if you bring a, a Wonderland type attraction down then, as opposed to thermos spa for the wellness types uh, with a giant, you know. Uh, a, garage type entrance that we can't even see the waterfront anymore this is insanity uh and uh, sabrina's bang on the whole uh, uh bringing ontario uh, science center down here is a distraction the whole thermo spa thing let's deal with that separately completely and just kill it if it's at all possible it's ridiculous to be going for as you say they're not even saying it's a p3 so what kind of deals have been signed right what kind of sweethearts have we got here they're going to put a little extra bit of waterfront around the edge of it for us so we can all walk around and look back at the spa and not be able to see the city because the spa is too damn big uh this this is insanity the science center as well if we want to get into that later the whole wasn't that uh, uh sort of sold to us as uh, the science center would be the terminus stop and that uh, Flemington Park area and the Science Center would be getting a major subway terminus right there? Well, they're still going to get it. We're just going to rename it now because they're losing the Science Center. It's sort of the hub of that community and a community that doesn't have a lot of a center to it. Uh, so that's a whole other thing. But the waterfront giving Thermos Spa, Thermae, Therma, whatever. They, they don't have an accent they grab on there. Is it Therm? Oh, therma. I don't know. What, therma Spa. I'm going with Thermos. I like it. It's a bit more practical. <laughs> uh, seriously. Generates heat. Generates heat. It does something useful. This apparently does not. And I really, uh, people may not, want to, may not want it to be a major issue in the mayoral race. I think it's a huge issue. It's the waterfront. Fight it. Stop it. Do something. No one is calling for this other than the people that are being employed to call for this. I want to get to you in a second, John. just want to clarify something on the, on the uh, parking uh, lot aspect, the garage, uh, Sabrina. Was that added after the award was given the, in terms of the bid for this project? Uh, my understanding is that, yeah, I think like the proposal sort of came after. And as we know, like they have changed a bit. I think now they have a bit more like public space just after a lot of this backlash um, that they received. Uh, and, and of course, like there's like a, there's co- consultations going on at the city level too. And so, um, yes, I mean, the plans were not necessarily approved, you know, as we see them, like they, I guess they had some wiggle room, it seems like to, to maybe change them around. And one thing I guess I just want to point out is like a fun fact, um, since we're talking about Therma is that the, um, one of the guys who works for them now doing some of the calm side, uh, is Mark Lawson, who is a former chief of staff to the finance minister. So uh, do with that what you will, but it's a small, small world. And they're exempt from the EA. They're not even getting an environmental assessment on waterfront land that we're giving to this private. Come on. At least that. At least have a waterfront assessment on this new walkway they're going to build for us, or this landfill they're going to dump into the the uh, lake so that they can have their Thermae Spa right out well, in the Well, they front. keep talking about flooding, too. And so you'd think oh, that yeah, they would floods. have a bit of a assessment about what, what all this new stuff is going to do to the to the island like it's like are we going to be sinking soon um which seems to be where where we're headed but um yeah a lot of unanswered questions and i think you know the ford government is not doing a very good job of uh damage control here they're really just creating more more questions and more controversy trying to cover up or maybe distract from the first controversy okay john i i i want to get to your you know your front porch assessment uh to all of this because that's normally where we 
we, we start our conversation with you and stuff like this. But just to frame this a little bit, the whole idea that this is for everyone. That's, you know, there's an opportunity here for all Ontarians to come. I did the math, the quick math on admission rates for a family of four to go to Science Center on and take in a, um, one of the uh, Cinesphere movies and then to go to the water park and take the you know, water slide at the Thermo Spa is nearly $300 for a family of four. That's a big ticket for a few hours to hang around Ontario Place, the Science Center. So it, 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 I don't... I, there are so many optics around this that are bad <laughs> and very few answers that are provided. But as you often point out, we're the ones here standing right looking in the, in the, you know, the big glass window and we're getting the front row seat to it. Most people have other things on their mind and they couldn't care less. Yeah, and we always have to remind ourselves that the people who uh, elect the Ford government don't live in downtown Toronto. Right. I mean, they are completely and utterly against the government. Um, number two, uh, again, we don't, I don't know, just like anybody here or elsewhere, what the absolute details are and all of this stuff. We do know the politics, though, and to suggest that this has been in the works for years, look, you and I know how politics works. We could probably go back 20 years ago and find that some wag in a communications office put it on the table at Cabinet saying, you know what, we should think about having the Science Center move down there, and there you go. 20 years we've been looking at this thing, so who knows how serious it's been. But here's a, a couple of realities. Again, I don't like to kind of pull my ancient history on this, but having worked as a summer student down there for eight summers, let's remember one thing. Nobody went to Ontario Place to walk in a park, for God's sake. They went there because of the forum offered great entertainment. Even the pods were the most boring things in the world. I, I was there the day it opened. I have walked every ounce of that. People by the millions went down there to see all kinds of stuff in the forum. And when the Budweiser stage came in under the NDP, it blew the place apart. So you got to have a big draw for people to go there. Secondly, <clears throat> last time I checked... Um, the, the province doesn't own the land that the Science Center sits on. It may own the Science Center, and it may own all the stuff inside of it. And nothing stopped, I guess, from my view, nothing stops you from taking all those gongs and clang, clanging things and lights and listening devices that we all, we all went there and when we were in grade eight and we saw them and they're still there. Nothing stops them from taking those and throwing them down in the pods anyways. But, I mean, the whole logistics of saying to the city, hey, don't you lease the land here? Like, don't we have an agreement with you? Is either incredible leverage for the city to say, hey, don't you want to bail us out and take the TTC before you do anything? I mean, that's that's another part of this. But if you want to go and take a bunch of clangers and move them down there, go ahead. But then you kind of think, well, where are all the buses going to go? What I mean, we got kids who are going to go down there during the wintertime. And they're going to walk across, you know, what we used to call, uh, you know, COD 30, level 30. They're going to walk into these pods that are freezing cold. And the snow is going to be... Like all the logistics of this, and plus, you know, this the big spa and everything there. I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to attract anybody there. But I, I guess at the end of the day, Dave, <clears throat> it just comes down to the fact that this is a huge parcel of land that no one, no one has yet to put a real vision around. Everything is piecemeal. Hey, you want a condo here? Put a condo there. You want to hurt? You know, you want a spa? Put a spa. Let's move the. It, it just goes on and on and on this list. Every government we get in tries to look at it when they miss the, the major point of it. And that was, it was about entertainment. It was about drawing people down there for next to no money so they could see some things that they normally wouldn't be able to see. And what this does is take that entire waterfront and just make it a political stalemate. So my prediction on all this, regardless of how much power the province has over what site goes where and that's, I don't think anything's going to happen. Like, I, I honestly don't. I, I think that even if, you know, the Ford government, who knows politics is a lifetime, let's say the Liberals and the NDP, you know, have an upsurge in the polls and and in the next two and a half years manage to form a minority government or otherwise, this thing's dead, done, zero. And there'll be all kinds of penalties to pay for and things like, like who knows. But I, I don't think right now it's it's a matter for great concern of the public in Toronto. The public in Toronto cares about subway safety, gridlock, bailing out the city, making sure that we can have a viable downtown core. And frankly, you talk about Mr. Mitch's front porch, fix my potholes, get the city looking good. That's where we're at. We don't care about the side circus show that's going on. And I, I think it's going to cause, 
I, I'd watch the city right now and the committee that deals with the owner, the lease of that land. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's where it's all going to happen, where somebody says, oh, you can do what you want with the interior part of it. But no, you can't change that area because it's supposed to be a science center and, and it can only be. And if you think we're going to turn it into some kind of subdivision for for housing, you've got another thing coming. I think that's where the rubber's going to meet the road at the end of the day. Yeah, except I don't hear any of the candidates, with the exception of Josh Matlow, uh, uh, really strenuously objecting to the, the the science center move and building more housing and even matlow's uh, view is it's you know it's the economic hub of the neighborhood um, take a walk in the neighborhood josh because there's not a lot there uh, yeah I, but but can i just jump in there and say like if i was if i'm sitting looking at almost a billion dollars worth of debt and i'm hoping that some party is going to bail me out to about half of it i'm not going to disagree with this what am I going to do? I said, like, oh, I'm going to do everything to stop this, you know? And you go to the door after your mayor, and it's kind of like, yeah, well, I'll stop you. See you later, buddy. I mean, like, you're not going to you're not going to do that. So I think what you do is you play the politics of this. You play the long game on it. And it's kind of like, you know, oh, I'll fill your boots. Out of go. Let's get it all going like that. When you know that a whole bunch of stuff is not going to happen. And so over the next 60 days or so, you know, even beyond, uh, and even beyond uh, electing the mayor there, I don't think this really has a there there, like unless it gets down to some negotiation where they're going to bail out and take other things for it, because this is a land swap, but it's also a financial swap. And I think that's the leverage that somebody's going to have to bear at the end of the day. Well, in some cases, then, Sabrina, Anna Bylaw was in the in the in the perfect spot because she took advantage of knowing full well that this plan had been under discussion before she made the announcement about moving it, putting housing in there. And then if it doesn't come through, she can say, well, what is me? Look at those idiots at Queens Park. They're the ones who blew it and, and didn't manage. If that does happen, then she has the similar leverage that, that John's talking about because, again, um, there's a matter of uh, the land swap and the money involved. Yeah, Anna Bailao comes off looking very prescient in this whole thing, right? Um, and there's a lot of speculation about why that is, the timing of all of this. Um, you know, she does have Nick Kuvalis, uh backing her. You know, uh, there's a lot of questions as to whether she was tipped off and knew this was coming. Um, the, the Premier likes to tell us they've, they've been working on this for a while, but... As much as the premier likes to say he's staying out of this mayoral race, like he is fully in the thick of it. Like that is just completely out the window. Um, I'm sure, you know, he's not a fan of Olivia Chow jumping into the race. Uh, I'm sure he would call her one of those so-called lefties. Um, but but no, you know, I should also add that Anna Bilo does have some liberal people on her team too. Tom Allison is, is working with her. You know, he's been around liberal war rooms for for years now. Um, but of course, you know, I, I, I do think that, that John's right, that this is a big leverage moment for whoever the new mayor is going to be. Um, and, you know, they, they do have some leverage with Ontario Place because there's like this northern strip of land that is owned by the city that the province will need to move ahead with these plans. Um, but I think, you know, last night the committee didn't really make a decision on it. They basically said, we need more time to work on this. And Doug Ford basically was like, it doesn't matter. We're going to step in because at the end of the day, he could do that. He could he could just rewrite a law and and take over things. Um, you know, municipalities are creatures of the province, but there is going to be a strong mayor. And I think that, it, you know, as much as this might be a so-called elite problem you know people are worried about the ttc their potholes garbage pickup and what have you rather than maybe this um you know more lofty ambitious goal at ontario place uh i I do think that you know this is an important move and uh for the you know for it to be a wedge issue in the mayoral election is just doug ford kind of using this to his advantage i think but you're right like it's just a a big conversation now about what is and i think probably after june um you know when we have a new mayor in place i think it'll get a lot quieter on on this front because it's not anything that's going to happen overnight um and so yeah it does feel like a very politically driven conversation but yeah everything is political i guess well keith is it coincidental then that city hall comes out with their report and it's the you know on, on multiplex housing uh, abilities in, in Toronto so that, you know, every neighborhood um, you can have, um, build a multiplex, you know, knock down the, 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 the detached four bedroom house and build a spot that has, you know, enough room for three apartments in it. Um, I begin to wonder what layer of politics that plays against the backdrop of all of this, because at some point now, when you look at the map, that's, 
in the Toronto Star this morning, if you actually went through with the plan and, and you know, tripled the amount of density in all of the neighborhoods where you could do this, you wouldn't need the green belt, for example, to be building more housing. No, you wouldn't need sunglasses either. Everyone would be sitting in shade in their backyards. Uh, yes, you, there's already reports that they don't need the green belt to manage the existing housing allotments in Hamilton, in, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in, all, in pretty well all the areas. It's not needed. It's a political decision right off the get to open the green belt for housing. Uh, some of it is close to service roads and they can make some arguments. Some of it is not. Uh, so this is very political all the way down the line. As for the uh, city coming out with this, I think this is something that the province is going to have to eventually do is, is declare this sort of zoning uh, right across the province, or at least in designated mm-hmm. areas where they want this housing. It's not going to be just the city of Toronto. Uh, it makes infinite sense. I don't think it's, it's hard for anyone to argue with, you know, increasing the densification along subway lines, along streetcar, mass street, you know, transit lines. This is just happening almost naturally, you could say. I mean, it's just where the condo developers and the housing developments are going. Uh, Outside of the city of Toronto, it's a different thing. And there's still huge backlash against, as there will be in some Toronto neighborhoods, against this idea of, you know, taller or, or more dense housing on residential streets, essentially. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, I, I lived in Cabbage Town for over 25 years. There were several little three-story apartment buildings tucked inside cottages. You don't even notice them as you walk down. Once the trees are in and, and it becomes an established neighborhood, you actually didn't even really notice them. And they weren't massive. They were three-story. And they have maybe had six units because they had like two going back. They weren't massive units by any stretch, but they were affordable housing, or at least in, <laughs> at one point they were relatively affordable housing for people to live in and rental housing in a core of the city. So this is how it's achieved. And it can be done to scale without dwarfing everything in the neighborhood. But what we're seeing is even two-story houses that somehow seem to dwarf and shade the bungalows right next to them. They're not creating more housing. They're just making bigger single-family homes. So yeah, if we can increase the density uh, without putting everyone totally into shade, it's absolutely the way to go. But I think it's going to have to be a provincial uh, bylaw or provincial rule coming in that, that it, uh, overrides city bylaws that prevent a lot of this type of housing designation from happening. Here's my conflict of interest. I live in downtown, midtown Toronto, and in 1947, there were five houses that were last built in our house, on our street that are somewhat different than the other ones, but they're all in a row. And if a developer wanted to come in there and take all five of us out and pay us you know, one and a half times whatever the market value is right now, we'd all sell. There you go. So we'd be out of there and they'd put up this row. <clears throat> it would look stately and Georgian type because that's what you do in midtown Toronto. <clears throat> and it would cost a fortune. So help me understand the affordability aspect of this or the attainability aspect of this because all this stuff about affordable housing in downtown Toronto is just ridiculous. I mean, I got, I got two kids home from university, one of which... He's now got a job um, and actually going to Ottawa starting on Monday because that's a place that they can afford. They're not going to live here. Um, They're going to go somewhere else. And yes, Sabrina, they're into politics. Can you imagine that? Um, But they're, they're going there. And the other one, you know, we had this conversation the other day. Go to Calgary. I mean, you seem like you're so far away when you're, you know, 40 years ago and, oh, my goodness, we'll never see you again. Now it's FaceTime every day. It seems like they're right in your own pocket. So, I, I mean, there's a whole issue here of the hollowing out of the court. Look at the provincial courthouse in downtown Toronto. They just spent a billion dollars on that sucker on, on University Avenue. They can't do anything with it because they don't have staff who can afford to work there. There's no people. There's nothing. It's not having anybody there. So the issue of affordability in this city is a ridiculous discussion. We're not having anything here that says, okay, well, if you're going to do this on the one hand, you've got to do that on the other hand. You've got to have, you know, a provincial government. You want to have, again, what's the leverage to a provincial government to do something? Or where's the city? And then it's all kind of like, well, we're not going to have that in our backyard type discussion. So, again, it's a little bit like, you know, the science center slash you know, let's call it the Hermes place, actually. Uh, You know, it's a very expensive place down by the waterfront. There's nothing here that that actually is about the affordability of a city. There's nothing here that's going to do anything. It's all about, well, let's have a spa, let's have a walk-up, let's do this, it's developers, it's all that sort of stuff. So I don't mean to be the, 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 I don't know, the whining willy out in the middle of nowhere here saying that this is bad because I'm going to benefit from it. 
make no bones about it. This, hello developers, this house is on the market when you want it. Because what I'll do is I'll trade it in and I'll buy a condo. There you go, done. But I don't think that this does anything except make the city far more expensive. By talking about Ontario Place and all these sort of things, it doesn't do anything for uploading the TTC. It doesn't do anything about lowering taxes. It doesn't do anything about the affordability of anything in the city. So, again, it's all a bunch of it's all a bunch of land plays for money. That's kind of where you know it looks like right right now from this perch. Well, and I was going to say, you know, the whole question of affordability will always be the sticking point, Sabrina. And it doesn't matter how whether we talk about the land, the Greenbelt lands, or you know John's neighborhood, uh, or some spot in Leslieville. It won't really matter because that affordability issue is going to be this weight around all governments' necks in terms of how they're going to cope with it. But I, I'm thinking that there needs to be, if we're going to do this, and you're going to coax me, you know, we're a little overhoused as well, to be able to say, oh, we want to do this with our property. But there should be some incentive then to make sure that at least a third of whatever I'm, you know, building is affordable. Or there's some kind of programming set there so that John's kids can, you know, live within a, a one-hour drive of home as opposed to, you know, four provinces four provinces away. That's one part of it. The other issue is here, density is great. In some cases, it provides more security for communities and all those sorts of things. But it means more stress on basic infrastructure, our water, sewage, uh, garbage pickup, schools, all of those sorts of things that, hmm, we used to have developer fees <laughs> uh, that would go to support all of that. So all of this is going in the wrong direction, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think the big question is like affordable for who, right? Um, obviously, everyone can agree there's a housing crisis, you know, um, everyone needs help here. And I think that, you know, since we're talking about these theories about the Ford government, like creating a cover for some of their more unpopular decisions, um, this big housing bill that we have from Steve Clark, his latest uh which is obviously about to be passed by a you know whopping majority PC government. Um, you know, it also includes some, uh, I guess, what housing advocates have described as like low hanging fruit uh, protections for tenants, like making it easier for tenants to put in air conditioning units. Which, okay, that's important, but it also comes alongside these regulations to make it easier for municipalities to expand their boundaries. And of course, that has um, you know created all these concerns about sprawl. I think Environmental Defense um, had had like a really good illustration of this, saying like you know imagine years from now there will be um, mid rises like in the middle of a cornfield, which which seems like out of place. But you're right, you know the Ford government um, has kind of been tinkering around the edges of this and. They have not even followed through on their own recommendations from their own housing task force uh, fully. You know, obviously, it seemed like they were waiting to do some of these things until after they were reelected because they're into their second mandate now. But, you know, I, I just kind of wonder, um, like, who they're helping out here, because there's there's obviously, you know, developers that are happy. Um, and, and they're getting, uh, you know, the, the processes are being sped up, let's say. Uh, and I think that is a good thing. But like, what else is it coming with? Like making it easier to put air conditioning for tenants. Um, you know, the, there's no really rent, no new rent control provisions here. So th there's really not much for tenants in terms of actually making, you know, things more affordable. They might be cooler in the summer. Uh, and, and then you know, municipalities, like obviously we know that the government scrapped these developer fees that we need to have like the sewage systems, the infrastructure to deal with this new housing. And they've promised to make municipalities whole, but th there's been questions about these audits. Like first they want to do municipal audits. There's all these questions about that. Um, even as they're going ahead with Toronto's audit, you know, who's, who else is getting it? Is there really going to be money to be found here? Um, and then I guess the, that's okay by the province. Like they're just not going to make them whole. Uh, I don't, it, it, it's, it, there's a lot of questions about, you know, who they're actually helping here with these policies. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you can probably prepare for a bit more pushback from the municipalities because around budget time, I think that they were a bit more tame than they have been. They were really happy about some of these measures to address homelessness and, and addictions, uh, which is obviously a big deal for, for cities and towns. But I think, you know, you can expect to see a bit more of a ramp up on that. And I know we're all fans of Bonnie Crombie here, but being a, a foil to Ford. Um, and so I think this is really like going to be one of her crusades in the, in the coming months is 
making municipalities um, able to handle all of these huge housing policies that are coming in, because of course, municipalities are the ones doing the heavy lifting here. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's been it. I mean, the whole idea of downloading it onto the municipalities, um, rather than uploading the services that they should otherwise be responsible for at the provincial and federal level. Just quickly, anybody give a rat's rectum that Olivia Chow is in the mayor's race in Toronto? No, no. But before I move on to Olivia Chow, I did want to just recap that one thing that Doug Ford said, because he's finally, he's, his true evolution on the green belt has come to the front here. Uh, and it was during the, the uh, Science Centre announcement the other day when he said, he just referred to it as that so-called green belt. That's what they call it. Mm-hmm. That's it right there. I'm sorry. I know we wanted to move on to Olivia Chow, but I thought that really summed up Doug Ford's evolution on this. I promise I won't touch your green belt after, of course, promising the developers in a secret videotape that he would open it up for them. So here he is. He's just literally dismissing it now as messaging, which I kind of was all along, I guess. Anyway, sorry. On to Olivia Chow. I'm glad there's a name in the race, but it's one of 50. So I don't know where the, what, how, I don't know how the math works. I really don't. I think you need like 15%. Maybe John would know like 15% of the vote and you become mayor. Well, yeah, but it, look, it comes down to, uh, to three things. And number one, what's your ground game like? Okay. Mm. So like, you got to get the vote out. You got to be in the municipalities. This is all about all four of us have been around campaigns for so long. So it's what's your team look like? Number two, what's your money look like? You got social media nowadays, you got all that sort of stuff, you got to raise the money for that. And number three, who are the strategists around it who can employ all that sort of mechanism to make it all work? And when you look at that, you've probably got about four candidates in the race that probably have got that going for them, right? Like those are the names we hear all the time. Although Josh Matlow is a bit surprising where he's got this kind of under <clears throat> underground kind of movement <clears throat> that gets his name out, <clears throat> excuse me, and all that sort of stuff. Olivia Chow, I, I, I assume that that comes with her. Like, I just make that assumption from where she is and the kind of grassroots that she has and all that sort of stuff. But as to a name that actually conjures up something fresh and new to this city, the answer is no. I mean, mm. I, it's just, I, I, I don't think if you have Mark Saunders and his team and his aggressiveness and his money and all of that stuff going on, she's, what's that, you know, she's, I mean, she's opening the door and he's already halfway around the world. Like, it, it, he's there. So I, I don't know what impact it's going to have overall for voters. Well, well you know, you, you sit 50 people up with names on the ballot, and I suppose that's a positive thing. People are stepping up and wanting to get involved in the process, which is great. But a lot has been made about the the criteria. I mean, you, you need a pocket change in 25 oh. signatures on a, on, a, on a petition to say, you know, I'm in. Whereas I was reading the Queen's Park Observer, and you were talking about the liberal leadership requirements there's a lot of dough on the line i'm going to have to put up front just to get my name into the hat and some of it it might be refundable depending on how well i do whatever um so the, the, whoever whoever wants to run for liberal leader is going to have to have more skin in the game than anybody who's running for mayor sabrina yeah, that's $100,000. It's not cheap. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it's something that we've seen from the Liberals in the past. Um, so I don't think anyone was really surprised. I actually heard a lot of the rules were just rubber stamped from the last time around. It wasn't that long ago they were looking for a leader. It's just 2020. Uh, although I guess it feels like a bit of a lifetime. Um, but I think that this certainly gives uh, people like Nate Erskine-Smith and Yasser Nakvi a bit of a leg up uh, because they have been but you know, uh, touring the province, soliciting donations, holding fundraising events. And the the thing that was, I guess, you know, stood out to me the most is the fact that the race, even though we have a date, so the Liberal Leadership Contest is December 2nd, um, they have not, the party has not given the notice to Elections Ontario. And so right now we're in this like gray area where the public doesn't get any disclosures of how much these campaigns are raising, who's donating. And, you know, it's not cheap. Like you said, $100,000 is not small change by any means. Um, And so until, you know, Elections Ontario officially gets the notice from the party, which they say is coming sometime in the near future, uh, we can just guess at how much these people are raising and and who's donating to them. But uh, I will be digging into that. It's kind of a new thing that leadership contests are being regulated by Elections Ontario. So that I'm happy for whatever transparency we get when we get it. but the the they're off they're 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 starting here and so i think uh we we all know mitzi hunter is is no longer running for olp she's now going for toronto mayor but she hasn't given up her mpp seat yet so i think there's 
It's, and meanwhile, we have Ted Shu, Stephanie Bowman, Adil Shamji, basically half of this caucus running, running. Um, so I think their caucus meetings are a little uh, awkward, <laughs> I guess you could say. Everybody's c- cards close to the chest. All right, that'll do it for us. Thanks to Keith Leslie, John Wright, Sabrina and Angie. This is On the Ledge, your Ontario Politics podcast. We are in your feed every Friday. Uh, Otherwise, you might want to check out our Monday to Thursday offering at Story Story Studio Network. I should get that right. Yeah, we uh, offer up uh, now and next. And so we've always got something and cool people to talk to. That's now and next, wherever you find your podcasts. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.